Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Shifting from Efficient to Agile Supply Chains uh, webinar sponsored and presented by Ultra Consultants in Argonneau. My name is Tim Green, and I'm one of the marketing managers for Ultra Consultants, and I'll be hosting the webinar. Uh, before we get going, there are three things to know. Attendee phones will be muted for the duration of the presentation. Please feel free to send me a chat if you run into any technical difficulties during the event. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A feature. We'll address your questions during the Q&A segment at the end of the discussion. You can access both the chat and Q&A features of Zoom by placing your cursor over the bottom center of your webinar screen and clicking on the icons. Today's session will run for 45 minutes and end at 1.45 p.m. Central Time. We'll begin the webinar by introducing our panel and with brief overviews of their companies and services. And then we'll quickly move on to today's discussion on the broken supply chain, short and long-term solutions, best practices, and how modern supply chain technologies can ease the pain. Following the discussion, we'll preview additional resources that we will provide to you, then move on to Q&A for the remaining time. It's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. David Saunders is a senior consultant for Ultra Consultants. He has more than 25 years of experience helping midsize and large manufacturing organizations and distribution companies leverage modern ERP technologies, optimize their operations, and accelerate their business processes. And Dale Robinick, who is principal for Argano, Argano SCMO2 and co-lead of the company's supply chain performance improvement practice. For more than 30 years, Dale has been an evangelist for di digital business transformation, helping companies identify value through organization design, supply chain optimization, and technology alignment. Uh, Dale, I, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little more about Argano. Thanks, Tim. Argano is a relatively new company. Uh, we are an organization that was created last year and Argano is, uh, has six joiner companies at the moment. Uh, our primary focus is B2B space where we help organizations through digital transformation. Uh, that ranges everything from CRM, CPQ activities all the way through supply chain and the final analysis around enterprise performance uh, management. We also have one of our uh, joiner companies focusing on key B2C areas as well. Argano SCMO2 um, is the supply chain management organization within the Argano uh, joiner company framework. And we're very excited about being here with you, Ultra Consultants, talking through supply chain. Thanks, Dale. Uh, now I get to tell you about Ultra Consultants. Ultra is an independent enterprise software consulting firm serving the manufacturing and distribution industries in North America and around the world, leveraging our ERP expertise, industry experience, today's best practices, and a rigorous methodology. We help organizations realize the bottom line benefits of modern enterprise technologies. Being independent means we use a neutral fact-based structure to support the technology selection process and help our customers find the right solution for their industry organization and processes. And because we focus exclusively on manufacturing and distribution, we offer exceptional industry knowledge, nuanced insight, and a deep experience-based understanding of what's important and what isn't, and what works and what doesn't. To learn more about our business process improvement, enterprise technology selection, solution implementation management, and business value realization services, go to ultraconsultants.com. Okay, David and Dale, let's get to it. You ready to go? Absolutely. All right. So I think we can all agree that the uh, global supply chain is broken and has been for a while and looks like it will continue to be. What's happening um, and why is it happening? Yeah, so... So Tim, thanks for, for the introduction and uh, Dale, glad to be doing this in conjunction with you. So, and welcome everyone. So, so, you know, there's a lot of press out there, a lot of discussions around the pandemic and did it cause the supply chain issues we're encountering? And what, from my perspective, at least, 
pandemic was really kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. Uh, but this has been something that in my mind has been building for a while. Um, and, you know, I know in our practice in working with our customers, there's a lot of talk about how do we come, become more efficient because we're starting to have workforce shortages. And, and it's really kind of reflective of the aging out of, of the baby boomer generation, if you will. Um, and then, you know, just other things occurring. And, and what the pandemic did was really accelerate that. You know, there, there was certainly, you know, a, a large loss of life as a result of the pandemic. But there was also a lot of people who in their careers might have been at a point where they decided, were deciding, when do I want to retire? And they took the pandemic as an opportunity to, to accelerate that. So those areas that we were starting to feel for labor shortages, just the pandemic really just accelerated that, you know, and, and you know, now trying to come out of it, you know, we're, we're getting issues of, again, the effect of that workforce. I saw something, I think, from the American Truckers Association that said, indicated over the next five to 10 years that there was going to be a need for like a billion drivers. So, you know, that's going to be really difficult to overcome. So, you know, when we see the pictures of, of all those ships out in the ocean trying to get into Long Island and Long Los Angeles ports, um, the, the huge stacks of, of containers that are sitting on the docks is, you know, it's just people, you know, all of a sudden getting things and, and it gets to a bottleneck and trying to get out of that bottleneck it has really proven, proven a problem, obviously. Um, and then the other component of this is, you know, we've been so focused on lean, that concept of lean. And I'm not saying lean is wrong. It absolutely is correct and it's the right approach, but there, maybe we went over um, board in some of those capacities. So, you know, we took inventory levels way down, not in, you know, planning for, you know, disturbances in the supply chain, if you will. Um, and, you know, the pandemic proved a huge unplanned disturbance and, and people are just, you know, have, have been forced to kind of react to that. And to the other aspect for me is, you know, the consumer spend, you know, all of a sudden we had all these people working from home and they, they need to go buy new technology or they were now in their own space and they realized I don't like my desk or, you know, other products that I want to upgrade it. So, you know, it was kind of a change in the buying patterns, which, which really helped it out. Um, but I, I think, you know, is it broken? I'm not sure broken is the right term, um, but is it challenged? Absolutely. Um, and and I, I know, Dale, you know, when we had some of our, our earlier discussions on this topic, you know, one of the things that you, you kept coming back to was the importance of the master data. And it's not a static, as many people think, but it, it goes, it, it needs to be reviewed. So, you know, what are your thoughts on, on you know, where we're at with the supply chain? And David, thanks. Um, Actually, Tim, if you'd be so kind, uh, there is two slides I think that would be really helpful to use to help frame what I, what I believe are the challenges we're wrestling with at the moment. <clears throat> First thing is, is the concept of, um, you know, we talk about efficient supply chain, efficient operations. And I'm borrowing a methodology or a maturity model from supply chain insights to kind of talk through this. And I think it's a fairly good way from an industry standard vantage point to talk about, you know, what's efficient, what are we trying to get at? And if we talk about agile, what we're really trying to get to. So if I think about efficient supply chain as a starting point, it's all right, I've done a pretty good job of managing my cost. I've thought about it in the context of my procure to pay and my order to cash cycle. And I want to smooth those two things out. How do I get the materials that I want into my operation? How do I convert them appropriately? And, and then distribute to whoever my customer is going to be. That's kind of like the basis. So if you think about that, that's kind of maturity level one. Maturity level two and is then kind of getting to the idea of a reliable supply chain. That's the idea of do I have my do I have the right product? in the right place, at the right time, at the right cost. And a lot of organizations have done a lot of work to be able to be both efficient and reliable. The third level is then moving into the context of a resilient supply chain or a re resilient enterprise. And this is where now we're putting some tech technologies or strategies in play 
to be able to manage demand um, volatility and supply volatility. And we can we use different strategies to do that. More often than not, what we're using is the concept of safety stock. And David, to tie back to one of your, you know one of your comments, this is kind of where we start to think about you know how do we manage a little bit. But resilient doesn't cut it in this particular environment. And that's where we're going to the concept of an agile or adaptive supply chain, which is then being able to think about uh, what's happening and, and sense what's going on. Not that we are to ever be able to predict COVID and the implications of, of COVID, but being able to respond to COVID and the implications of COVID. And the, the last one in the model is then having a market aligned or market driven supply chain where you're no longer thinking about it from an inside out perspective, but you're thinking about it from an outside in perspective. And this is when you are now working to build relationships up and down the supply chain where you're collaborating together. And there are several companies that, and, and several, you know, several industries where this happens, but it is still more of the exception than the rule. So this is kind of how I view the whole idea of supply chain. And you know, we certainly got efficiencies. The, now the question is how do we get to agile and or adaptive? If you would be so kind, uh, Tim, to kind of go to the next slide then, which kind of frames it up. And you know, we think about it, you know, what we're trying to accomplish is how do we get material from our suppliers, know what we need to buy or what we're going to uh, manufacture get it through our manufacturing operations, get it into distribution, get it from distribution through transportation into retail. And I'm just using a, a, you know, a CPQ retail example for, uh, at, at, as a model here. And the whole idea of efficient and, um, and reliable is effectively making sure that the connections between these pieces are done well. And what we've done is we've leaned out the model. We basically drained all of the inventory out of each of the different points. We've made everything just in time. Now we're able to, uh, to, to run. But what are we trying to do now? Or what do we need to do now? It's the thought process of how do we get to adaptive or resilient supply chains. Resilient in the context here is I, uh, capacity for re resistance and recovery, but adaptive is re reacting to significant changes in structure disruptions or behavior. And I think adaptive is really where the where most organizations need to be thinking going forward. So uh, to frame up my perspective, you know, did COVID cause this? I think COVID as a pandemic triggered it. We had three months of worldwide shutdown, which basically stopped everybody from producing anything. We then went uh, to government uh, investment that said, here, we need to make sure, at least in the United States, that people are able to uh, continue to live. They took that investment and they said, well, I can't go spend it on services, but I'm going to go spend it on product, which now creates a bubble required need. That gets pushed down the supply chain path. We then want to bring product back from China. That generates a problem in the supply chain. And we've got a bubble that's kind of flowing back and forth. And at this juncture, it's going to it's going to take a fair amount of time to to have this process weed itself out. So that's actually the next question: When will the global yeah. supply chain be fixed? Uh, are we looking at eighteen months, two years, ten years, two two days? What's the answer? Well, David, the I'm best not sure. Answer. If you, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if you've got a, a good crystal ball. <laughs> I think that you know a, a partner, my partner in um, in our supply chain performance improvement practice, and I did a webinar around uh, COVID literally two weeks in, and, and we were using some lessons learned from a couple of companies we were doing work with at that particular point in time, and we thought, gee, maybe the shocks would last through the end of uh, you know 2020 into 2021. I think we realized we underestimated that pretty significantly. Um, I think based upon the analysis or that I've read and, and looking at the, uh, the Economist's uh, normalcy index, we're probably 18 to 24 months away. End of 2022 probably is a reasonable place to be thinking about. 
And most things that I read is that at least in many sectors in the United States, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah, I've really heard, you know, the worse than better part. I've heard that several times, you know, several have said that. Now, I think it's it's a difficult question to answer. Obviously, we don't have first of all, you know, we think we're coming out of the pandemic and then all of a sudden we get a new variation and, you know, things start to get locked down again. And, and but, I, you know, I guess really the question is, what's the definition of ending? Because in my mind, I think there is an aspect of, and, and Dale, you referred to the normalcy index. Well, what is normal going to be at some point in the future. It's not certainly gonna be what it was before the pandemic, but what will it look like and, and what really is ending? I think some segments are gonna, you know, let's call it resolve their supply chain issues, get product in, on the, in, in the warehouse, into the plant, be able to provide product to their customers. I think we'll see segments that are able to resolve that sooner rather than later. And there are certainly other ones that that 18 to 24 months might actually end up being optimistic. Um, but I, I think the 18 to 24 months is, is really um, a reasonable expectation and something that we should be working towards. And Tim, also, I'm going to tackle yeah. the, the companies, write it out. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, there's going to be companies that are like, wow, that's really difficult to deal with can we just tough it out yeah and, and frankly i mean i guess you can always take that approach i certainly don't think it is a recommended approach um i, I think in general people need to be able to start looking at and that kind of gets into your next question but you know what are, what can we do as a company to to you know short and long term to overcome this situation that we're in. And again, you know, if you go back to and thinking in terms of the pandemic, it was just kind of the needle that broke the, the camel's back, if you will, and not just the issue itself, you know, that means that I can't keep doing things just, I can't ignore it because those, those things that we're dealing with are going to continue and, and really probably even get worse. And so I may be surviving today. That doesn't mean, and probably doesn't mean I'm going to be able to survive tomorrow. So I, I'm very adamant that people need to take, you know, proactive, and proactive would have been before this ever occurred, but actively going after solutions to say, what can I do to mitigate today's issues I'm having with my supply chain? And understanding that there will be there will be future disruptions, new disruptions. That how do we react to that? I don't know if you've got additional thoughts on that. Well, I would say that if you're going to write it out, the, the likelihood of your company being in as good a position as another organization that chose to be uh, actively managing the problem will be very different. I. I think that there's a whole host of things that organizations need to be thinking about. Most have to think about it in one way, shape or form. Uh, but I think that there's uh, several things that, you know, I would say fall into the category of leading practice that you need to be thinking about today. And, and it's gonna be different by industry. Yep. But I mean, the very first thing that I, that I go back to is, you know, companies don't compete. Supply chains compete. And you've got to, and you're not the only piece of the supply chain. And you've got to be thinking about how are you going to build the relationships with your vendors and your customers in an intelligent way and actually have it be a partnership so that your portion of the supply chain remains vibrant, strong, and, and maybe even uh, give you an opportunity to take market share in an environment where everybody else needs to give market share. So I, mean, I, I think you have to be proactive and simply writing it out is not a particularly good path forward. All right, so makes a nice segue to the next question. So yeah, let's get serious about solutions. What are some potential short-term and long-term solutions? What can, what can companies do now and what can they do for the future? Dale, why don't you go ahead and start with that? Because you already kind of started alluding to that in your answer. So I don't want to get in the way of 
of okay. that thought process. Uh, there's there's a there's a few things that kind of jump out at me. One one is um, you you might want to choose to be transparent uh, with your partners and actually in the supply chain and truly be a partner. Uh, I think it's uh, no longer practical for the concept of you know sending out a RFI RFP saying all, all, all vendors are effectively equal and I'm competing on price to try to figure out how do I get the best deal. That's, you know, that's 2010 thinking. That's not 2021 thinking at this juncture. So I mean, very first thing is think about the relationships you have uh, that, you know, that as a stock starting point one. Starting point two, and these are all short-term things. They're, they're not things that take months or quarters to accomplish. They're things that you could be thinking about right now. Second thing is we need a way of being able to build buffers within our supply chain. There's gonna to continue to be shocks and disruptions. Right now, the primary buffering tool that we have is called inventory. And the question, and when we set inventory within the, the, uh, the, the network, we think about it in the context of safety stock. That's one type of inventory management strategy that we would be thinking about. How do I buffer my raw materials from my supplier? How do I buffer in transit inventories? How do I buffer uh, production inventories or cycling strategies for cycle uh, for how often I'm going to manufacture something? Uh, or I'm able to procure it and get it. So we're only thinking about one buffering strategy. We need to put all of them in play and how we want to manage. Which then takes me to a third thought, which is, you know, we've uh, we designed our supply chains uh, and we've laid them out and we might have done great network modeling and come up with what the right way to flow the material through the network to get to your customer in a given location is. We set that up, we did the analysis, we got all the data and then we loaded it into the ERP system and that became our master data. And none of that, uh, you know, we think about in the context of changing it ever. And in reality, that all needs to be considered dynamic data. And we need to be thinking about resetting what, what the uh, length uh, transport times are coming from China into a port, into the port, into uh, through the port, into a DC. I suspect in every person, every uh, company that is listening to this webinar right now, all of your lead times are set for what it was a year ago in your, in your ERP system. Think about going in and making those adjustments. Now we're gonna to start to have a bit of a dynamic model we can work with going forward. So I mean, that, those are a few that I would think about to start. Yeah, and, and Dale, I, I mean, I just kind of build on those and I totally 100% agree with, with those three. I also look at from a kind of a strategy perspective, you know, there are things that, you know, building on the, you know, your vendors, your key partners is have you developed a, a stratification of your vendors and truly understand there are some that are really super important to provide because they provide a raw material or a component or a finished good that is extraordinarily profitable and it's core to your, your, your product offering. And so, and do you, have that relation, collaborative relationship with them so that, you know, if you talk win-win type of scenario, you both are, are transparent with each other, collaborating. And part of that discussion then extends into, and, and you had it on an earlier slide and talk briefly to it is, it's not just your primary suppliers and secondary suppliers, but it's their primary, secondary, tertiary suppliers. You've got to go all the way down because frankly, you know, the auto industry was, to me, this was a great example. You know, I went shopping for a car not too long ago and, and all I kept hearing was, yeah, availability is very limited. Nothing's coming out of the plants. You know, I'm thinking, okay, they're, they're short of labor. The people are sick. Like, no, there's a microchip that our manufacturing companies haven't been able to get. And it's one chip manufacturer who's providing this to all the auto manufacturers. So everybody was being implicated by it. Okay, well, I know my part suppliers are, you know, they're providing components. Uh, they're good. They're, they're very reputable and, and there shouldn't be a risk there. But if you understood that there was a chip underneath it, you know, that really was kind of that, that constraint, if you think of theory of constraints type of, of talk, that manufacturer then became the key constraint 
that if you had looked at it and it gets to one of my next points is, would you, might you have looked at product design in a slightly different manner to say, wow, you know what? I've got my component design with this specific chip, but maybe I should design it so it's flexible that I, with a minor change or I have a design, if that chip no longer becomes available, I can switch it to another chip manufacturer or a different you know, processor of some sort. So I, to me, it's, it's that kind of getting in that relationship and, and the vendors stratifying with them, having a key strategy. Do I put all my eggs in one bu bucket? Can I you know, have some secondary suppliers as backup? Um, and as well as looking at product design to say, do I have flexibility to maybe change things? The other aspect for me on product design really comes into, do I wanna have a product offering of I, I make a shirt or something and it's the exact same shirt, but I've got it in 50 different patterns. But frankly, four of those 50 patterns account for 80% of my sales. Well, do I have a strategy in place to say, well, maybe I don't wanna offer all those other patterns and colors, but I always, always want to make sure I have stock of those four. So back to your point, Dale, maybe I need to change the stocking requirements for those four shirts and patterns so that I've got increased stock for it. And maybe the other 50, 48, if I can do my math right, um, 46, if I'm saying 50 patterns, I'll get it right yet. <laughs> so is it that I either no longer decide to no longer offer them or just really cut back on my stocking for that, those. And if I'm out of it, then I've got a substitution that gets them back into one of the four. So I, I think there, there is a lot that can be done short term to help kind of get you out of, or at least put you in a better position to come out of probably the issues that many of us are facing today in, in our supply chain. From a short-term vantage point, I think we covered off a few of them. I mean, it, and I, I think these are important. If I were to think about it uh, kind of transitioning a little bit longer term, uh, I think then it's, we start thinking about, all right, and you, you mentioned a few of them, and I think it's a little bit harder to be able to implement uh, the, uh, I have suppliers, can I, can I, can I rationalize a part so that I could get it from several suppliers uh, that becomes a little bit more of a how do I design in resiliency mm -hmm. or uh, into my model, and those are things that absolutely need to happen uh, all around the concept of product uh, strategy, product rationalization, and design considerations. Uh, it also then kind of takes to the idea of um, you know we're, we've offshored a lot of stuff. Are we going to onshore? I don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure if it was you that mentioned it while we were in a um, uh, in a prep session, but I, the new term that I think is making the rounds is best shore. So where, you know, where should you be sourcing going forward? Th these are the things that now you're going to take six months to 12, you know, six months, 12 yeah. months, 18 months to get into place. But there are still things that need to be thought about in the context of, all right, I'm going to have uh, uh, dynamic shocks in, our, in the network. What do I need to do to dampen those shocks going forward? I did see, um, uh, Tim, that there was a question in the chat. Do we want to tackle that uh, as part of Q&A? Uh, yeah, we'll do that at the end. Okay. We'll do that. We've got a couple questions. So we actually covered off on best practices here. We've talked about a lot of ways, a lot of workarounds and a lot of what's the, what's the, the best ways <laughs> to get out of this issue. So let me, I think we can move on to modern, how can modern supply chain solutions and advanced technologies help ease the pain that everyone is feeling right now? Yeah, so, so for me, because uh, that's a lot of what we do is, is help our clients, you know, look at those solutions. I, I think there are a lot of, lot of you know, there, there's some solutions out there that people talk about and, and I'm hopeful Dale will talk to them, things like Control Tower and, and Digital Twin that, you know, it's kind of been out there, we keep hearing about, Kind of under the umbrella of Industry 4.0, uh, all the you know the different technologies, and there are certain technologies that certainly we are seeing being implemented, 
real life demonstration. And then there are a couple others that, you know, at least in theory, it, it sounds great, but maybe having a little bit uh, difficulty getting off the ground. But I think that there is an opportunity once you, you know, kind of know what your future is and, and know what direction you want to go. There is a lot of capability and solutions to help you get there. And, and you know, artificial intelligence is always out there in the forefront of, of every conversation. You know, what does machine learning look like and, and how to, can that help you? For me, those, those two specifically are around how can I take computer, computer processing and help you take all this data that you're covering, you know, capturing and can capture into, you know, a single, single system, if you will, single source of the truth we refer to it as. How can, how can I, what do I do with all that infra data that I'm collecting and, and making it actionable, to, you know, information? Um, I was just on a call with a client and, and that was exactly the, the, the topic that we were talking about is we want to, they want to go out and start capturing all this market data and, and, and it's like, okay, well, what are you going to do with this? And, and I think we need to, everyone needs to rely on those solutions to make it actionable. So I can collect all this data, but if I don't know what to do with it and I don't find the trends and all that other stuff, it's just data and I, there's not a lot I can do with that. But, you know, Dale, I, I think, you know, we talked and, and I know you, you had a lot more insight into you know, I referenced the digital twin and in the control tower. So I, I want to let you talk to that because I think those are, are really important um, opportunities for individuals. So I think about uh, when, when we talk about water supply chain solutions and advanced technologies, I kind of think about things in a couple of different buckets. Um, and, and I do think that we are uh, at the edge of a, a sea change of capability that we're just starting to get our hands around. And, and, the, and what's driving that is we, we're, we now have ubiquitous computing availability and u, ubiquitous uh, data storage available in the cloud. And, and it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a sea change capability going forward which means there's a lot of the ideas we're kicking around here, the concept of a digital twin. Um, I've been listening to that as an idea for, and talking about it as an idea for 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Um, I was reminded by a, uh, an associate that said, you know, the first digital twin was designed around Apollo 13. And, it, it, and you think about what happened in Apollo 13. And if you remember, it's, this, it, it's the space shot that was to go to the moon and didn't. And it, there was a digital twin or a twin of every piece of equipment that was in space down um, on the ground. And we needed the solution for the, uh, the 13 volt undercurrent that, uh, on how to turn things back on. And they were able to do that because they had a digital, I mean, they had a physical twin and figure out how do you do something before you do it in reality. And, you know, the federal government had plenty of money. They, they built multiple of these. And that's one of the things that I think has been a challenge for organizations trying to tackle the concept of a digital twin. But I, what's changing now is we now can put these platforms or these technologies into the cloud we're able to scale as necessary. We can design an, a, 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 a duplicate of how I'm going to run the company or how I'm going to run the supply chain and be able to leverage it going forward. I think we're now at the point that we can that we can absolutely take advantage of these concepts. Um, you know, we talked about uh, control towers. Control towers a similar thing. I mean, it, it it's a concept that. If you have uh, a large supply chain, you've got a lot of money, you probably have got something that you've invested, but for the normal organization, not yet. And why? It's because we're not able to get to all the data necessary to be able to aggregate it up and see it. Um, there's a whole host of companies that are, from a, from a supply chain vantage point, that are now in the business of aggregating that information and being able to present it to a company um, you know, so that you know where your product is within the context of a supply chain. Um, and there are several vendor technologies that are, that are on the market that help enable that. So I think, you know, not just within my four walls, but across the supply chain, we're starting to get an opportunity to, to apply some of these concepts. Um, 
from the concept of AI uh, machine learning. I see that in the, in the context of solving specific problems, being able to look through demand patterns and see what's happening or man, map demand patterns for a company against foot traffic uh, in, a, in a store or those types of things going forward. Things that are difficult for us as a human uh, to be able to synthesize because what machines do a pretty good job of tackle. So I, I think that these are some of the things that are on, on, on the horizon. Yeah. I will make one other uh, comment and I do think this is, uh, it's a kind of important I, I do view some of these technologies independently. There, there are transactional system technologies, ERP, and then there's planning system and modeling system technologies, which are supply chain solutions. Those are two different entities. They have two different uses. And I think you need to treat the two as independent, but transactional systems shouldn't be static. They need to take the dynamic information that you're modeling in your supply chain environment and push it back in to rec represent reality going forward. Yeah, and that, that last comment is really good, Dale. And you know, the one other comment I wanted to kind of add in is, you know, easing the pain. I, you know, I think one of the things that, that we've seen also as a result of the pandemic, everybody working from home, is the growth in technologies like Zoom and, and those other virtual things where it's giving people trading partners, the opportunity to really collaborate real time. And people are feeling more comfortable because now this has become kind of the norm in many instances of how we interact with each other. And I think prior to the kind of pandemic was, it was there, we had Teams, we had you know, Zoom, we had you know, WebEx out there for, for teleconferencing, but not used widely. But now it, it's, you know, my day, a lot of my day is spent on Teams or Zoom calls with my clients um, and, you know, even taking tours of facilities. Um, and so, so that it, it kind of removes some of that travel time, that lost and unproductive time. But it's, I think people are feeling more comfortable with the ability to conduct business, if you will, virtually. And I, I think that's a huge shift for us as a culture. Well, I think one of the things that it does do is it demonstrates the concept of building the, the, a center of excellence around a capability and then being able to leverage that center of excellence in, in, a, in a wide range of areas. I, mean, I know we're a consulting company. We do systems integration work. Uh, we, we help companies you know, with supply chain problems. I'm doing coaching for uh, teams in all around, literally all around the world. I mean, I, I've got teams that, that, that are, and these are client teams that I'm doing the coaching for. Uh, I've got teams in Sweden that I'm doing this for, in, the, in, in Russia, in Eastern Europe, uh, even you know, in, in China and other places where we're having conversations. 10 years ago, I'd have to fly to have that conversation and it would, in, in order for that group to be able to get the experience base that we as, a, as an organization had would be almost impossible. And I think that it certainly has changed the dynamic. dynamic. And it's something that companies now can say, all right, I got, I got an expert in a given area and they happen to be based in Germany, but I don't have to bring them to the United States to solve the problem. It really has, it is a game changer, no question yeah. about it. Okay, we're a little tight on time and I wanna make sure we get to the Q&A here. We do have a couple of questions. Thanks, Dale and David. Um, I want to, so we'll move on to Q&A in a second. Um, and there's still time to submit your questions. If you have a question, um, you can access the Q&A feature by hovering your cursor over the bottom center of your webinar screen and clicking on the Q&A icon. Um, as promised, we'll be sharing some additional resources with uh, everyone who is on this call. Um, in a follow-up email later today, maybe maybe early tomorrow, the webinar recording and link links to two informative uh, blog posts from Ultra and Argano about resilient supply chain strategies and a link to our latest ebook, the Comprehensive ERP Success Guide. Um, and so let's let's do the questions. Uh, this question goes back to the beginning of the of the conversation. You know, can in the US, can the infrastructure 
the transportation and supply chain infrastructure dig itself out of this mess, you know, port capacity and lack of truck drivers, lack of trailers, that sort of thing. Is that, is that a thing that's going to be hard to dig, dig out of? The, the answer is yes, we will. The question is, is how long? Um, and I was having a, a conversation with one of the three PLs that we do some work with. And uh, one, of their, uh, one of their customers had um, uh, orders for the chassis, 150 chassis on order for the better part of a year, uh, just so that they could be able to move more uh, containers in and out of ports. Uh, so, so I mean, we, it, it's all up and down the supply chain, but slowly but surely, what's going to happen is is that you know the the, the uh, I think about it in the context of the theory of constraints, just like David uh, mentioned earlier. The constraints going to move back and forth as we we do have a fairly smart group of people in you know that are working to solve this. They're heavily incented to figure out how to make it work. It's going to happen over time. Um, but yes, I mean, court, court capacities are, are an issue in, um, in Savannah. Uh, there is an investment going on uh, to that just doubled the amount of rail capacity leaving the Savannah port. Uh, they, they put in its space to, to store another 14,000 uh, containers. Um, you know, there, there are things that are occurring. Uh, the infrastructure bill, it has fun, uh, you know, as a, has 50 billion funded in this given area that could be applied across the board. So I think there's a whole bunch of things that can end up occurring. All right. and, and I would agree with Dale and from the perspective, you know, but, you know, I always think of, of the creativity that the U.S. always seems to bring to bear on things, on problems, right? So we've got a problem as a society, we'll get real creative to fix it. It will get fixed. How soon? That's a good question. Uh, they, they had a story on 60 Minutes highlighting this whole discussion um, about the ports in Los Angeles and Long Beach. And they said part of the problem is, you know, they're starting to get a little finger pointing, but eventually the players are starting to talk about how do we get out of this? Because it's to everybody's benefit to get out of it. So it'll take time, but yes, it, they, they will find a way out. All right. We have time for one more question. And actually, it's an interesting one. A good, a good question to end on. So. The question is, so you guys have thrown out a bunch of possible solutions and workarounds. What are the three that are the most important? What are the priorities? Let me give, give mine and then David, you can come back and either agree or, or, or augment them. I think number one uh, is you've got you to treat everybody in your supply chain uh, as a partner and with respect and integrity and be uh, truthful and honest with what your needs are and expect that they're going to be truthful and honest with what their needs are so that you can collaboratively make it work. That, that's number one. Number two is don't treat uh, your network as a static item. It's a dynamic item and you need to treat that, uh, you need to take that dynamicism, dy however I might say that word, <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, adjust your master data in your transactional systems to, to, uh, to reflect it. And I'd say the third one is um, the serenity prayer. Uh, you know, you've heard grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There's a lot that you're, you as an organization or you as a person aren't, aren't going to be able to fix in the supply chain. Pick your battles intelligently, put your force into making those work well and invest a lot of time understanding which you can make a difference on and which you can't make a difference on. And I think those would be my, my three things I would suggest. Yeah, and, and I, I keep that last, the prayer close at hand at all times, just to remind me there are things I can control, go for it. Things I can't, let go. Um, I, I think, you know, piggybacking off the first point about, you know, transparency in, in a collaborative relationship, the trading partners, it's not only with your suppliers, but it's with your customers as well. Um, they, need, they want your honest feedback. And, you know, if you're telling to pay what industry and especially, if you're not gonna have something ready for them when, when they need it, you need to tell them up front, just so that they know, because what, what, 
in, in just went through this with a client recently is, and they're really looking for, okay, I know there's a backlog. I know there are issues getting supplies. If you're not going to get it, great. Tell me as soon as you know, don't wait to the week before you were going to ship it and then communicate to me, oh, by the way, it's really going to be another two months. Th that's just terrible. So that transparency is really, really critical. And it does build trust, which is important. You know, and, and for me, the, the, I guess maybe my third one would be, you know, step back and look at your business strategically and, you know, think about those things that we want to focus on and start to put a plan in place for achieving them and, and working forward so that you can solidify, solidify your supply chain and your ability to serve your customers. All right. Excellent. Good, good questions, good answers. Let's move where we need to wrap this up. So that concludes the webinar uh, for all of us at Ultra and Argano and for Dave Saunders and Dale Rabin Rabinick. Thank you for joining us today. Um, have a great rest of your day and we hope we uh, see you again soon at our next webinar. Thanks, Dale. Thanks, David. Appreciate Thanks, the opportunity. Bye-bye.